Hi, this is Zivi Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And speaking of books, I have two of my own books coming out this spring and summer. Princess Charming is a picture book, which debuts on April 19th, and Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature comes out on July 1st, and it is truly a labor of love. I hope you'll pre-order, order, order, and join me on tour as I go across the country. You can find out more at zivyowens.com or bookendsmemoir.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at zivyowens because I always post about everything. Enjoy the show. Sarah McCoy is the author of Mystique Island, a novel. Sarah is the New York Times, USA Today, and international best-selling author of the novel's Marilla of Green Gables, The Mapmaker's Children, The Baker's Daughter, and The Time It Snowed in Puerto Rico. Her work has been featured in Real Simple, The Millions, Your Health Monthly, Huffington Post, Writer Unboxed, and other publications. She hosted the NPR WSNC monthly radio program Bookmarked with Sarah McCoy and previously taught English and writing at Old Dominion University and at the University of Texas at El Paso. She currently lives with her husband, an orthopedic sports surgeon, their dog, Gilly, or maybe Jilly, and their cat, Tula Rosa, in North Carolina. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Mystique Island, a novel. I'm so happy to be here. This is sort of like a celebrity dream come true for an author to like get on and be able to talk to you and to all your readers. And it's been such a safe haven, actually, for readers and authors to be able to come during the pandemic and listen to your podcast. I listen to your podcast all the time. I was like, that's, there's my friend, there's Crystal yeah. Jalian, and they're, oh, they're alive. We're alive in this together. Thank God. So thank you for continuing to do those and doing so many of those during the pandemic. Oh, it was my pleasure. And I know it, like we were chatting before, I was like, I feel like we're, we've been Instagram friends for so long. (laughs) Just feels like a while. Maybe it wasn't that long, but I don't know. It's nice. It's just nice to meet even over Zoom. So, and I was so excited to see, so you were picked, what was it? The Amazon best literature fiction of the month. What was it? Yeah, I was, I was really, I was surprised and they don't like lead you into this. It's just sort of like a, your team at my team at Harper Collins just sends you an email and says, Oh, by the way, (laughs) Amazon picked you as a a best, you know, book of literature and fiction for the month. And on we go. And it (laughs) it sort of (laughs) told you because I wasn't expecting it and I was thrilled and I'm so happy that the book is getting out to readers and that it was chosen. So So exciting. Why don't you tell listeners about like what Mystic Island's about and how you set it here, why, how this whole thing came about, inspiration, you know, all that good stuff. Sure. Absolutely. The book opens in... 1972, when a Texan divorcee named Willie May docked her boat on Mystique Island. And it's this exclusive enclave of celebrities and royal residents. Uh, Mick Jagger continues to have a place there. At the time, it was Mick Jagger and Bianca who were there. And uh, Princess Margaret, she is one of the most notable and famed residents. She was given as a gift, because don't we all get this as a wedding gift? She was given as a wedding gift a piece of land by the owners, Colin and Ann Tennant, who own the island. And that's a whole nother like component of the book is purchasing an entire island of everything, land, people, industry, everything in the 19, you know, 60s, he bought it, but it just seems too ancient time. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? You know, yes. like people still buy islands with people living on them. That's crazy. But they they gave a piece of that to Princess Margaret as a wedding gift. And then she built her own mini palace, really, where she could do as she pleased. She <laughs> So there, that's another resident that's there. Uh, there. It was full of fashion models and gangsters. Uh, really, it was anyone who... And this this is fascinating. Well, it's fascinating to me to write about anyone that Colin Tennant decided was beautiful enough, and he was the master ceremony ringleader of who you know he was the gatekeeper of who was allowed 
to come onto his island because they registered as be- most beautiful for him. So you had to be beautiful and you had to have money. And it touched a scandal, usually. So that was the island. And then into that came these outsiders. So it's Willie May. She's the first one and she's the mother. And she comes to this island and is wooed there by Colin and Anne and looking for a place to settle after she has been blackballed from good English society by divorcing her brewery baron husband who then subsequently dies. <laughs> Has, so uh, she has no place to go. And she goes to Mystique and they say, you're, she's an ex-beauty queen. So they say, you're beautiful. You've got the money now that you, you've taken quite a bit from your divorce settlement and your husband is gone and you're kind of scandalous. So come on over and set up shop. And she does. And she invites her two daughters Uh, Hilly, who is a Vogue fashion model, and Joanne, who is a young musical sort of prodigy student, who are both, they're equally sort of lost in the world trying to find their way. And it's the 70s, early 70s, when that definitely mirrored women's movement at the time, where they were trying to find their footing as empowered new women, but not quite sure where what that meant or where that was. And all of that for me really echoed this whole island climate of each person is their own solitary floating island trying to find where they belong. And then you've got this one place where we're all now deserted on an island together. And one of my writing teachers, she said the best thing you can do for your characters is put them in a room by themselves and lock them up and make them all just like figure it out in there. And so an island is is a natural sort of room that you lock your characters up in. So that's exactly what this is. And it's, uh, you know, it's like lighting a a flame in a box. It just sort of like all just goes uh, on fire in a little mini bonfire. So it was a lot of fun for me to write, especially since it was grounded in, uh, it's historical fiction. So it's grounded in real facts, which Zibby, people think I make this stuff. I did not. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you asked about inspiration and I got inspired by this story during a time, an actually really rough time for me because I didn't know what I was going to write next. I had just written my book, Marilla of Green Gables, which is a very different island. I mean, Prince Edward Island, Avonlea, this sort of like very G-rated, lovely, beautiful place. And I, they said, what are you going to write next? And I didn't have an answer. And I, I know you know, you're an author. That is terrifying. That is like more terrifying. I mean, I broke out a little in a sweat right now talking about it because I'm like, oh my gosh. So I didn't know what I was going to write next. And when I get like that, I tend to go to other sources that make me happy. And one of them, creative sources, one of them is I have a real issue with binging biography, like film biographies, right? So anything that's like a documentary on someone's life, how they started as this tiny thing and that tiny thing bloomed in some big idea that just took over the world and changed. I love that stuff. Like I will watch that every day nonstop. So that's what I did. I started just watching documentaries. I just watched everything on HBO, everything on Netflix. I cleaned it out. I got, I have a PBS subscription because that has the best documentaries. Yeah. So <laughs> I literally just didn't read very much even. I was just watching and I listened to audiobooks. That's another of my big things. I love listening to a memoir, a celebrity memoir, a historical person memoir, where then or I get to hear like that story coming through. So I'm telling you this because these are all the things that are sort of already influencing my how I'm hearing the story coming to me is through these sort of historical and memoirs. So I picked up this. 
And I know, I know, I'm so old. It's like, who has DVDs anymore? I have a whole cabinet behind my okay, couch okay. full I of DVDs. Them. I don't know what to do with them. So I am equally right? old. Okay, I am so far older than I'm, you, I'm sure. So I absolutely love them. So I got this DVD and I was watching it and it's about Princess Margaret and her being a rebel. And there was a tiny little snippet about how she was given this island as a, as a wedding gift. And I am Puerto Rican. My mother's Puerto Rican. And so I wrote my first book called The Time and Snow in Puerto Rico. It was set in 1960s Puerto Rico. And it was about similar kind of like the island figuring things out. And do they want to be independent or do they want to go and be part of the United States? As So that was a real struggle at the time. So during the writing of that, I thought I had researched everything there was to know about the Caribbean. Like I, I was a little, you know, I had... I was pompous even. And that, you know, pride is, is right there. I should have known I was going to find something out I didn't know. So I was like, I know everything. I've researched this whole, I, you know, these are my people, the Taino Indians. I mean, I went deep with this. And then when I saw on the documentary that there was an island in the Caribbean, privately owned, called Mystique, I had never heard of it. And I just thought, no. So I've never heard of this. What is this? No. So I went and I am very type A and I had to Google everything on the planet that had this name in it and find out more about it. And so that's sort of what started me down the journey of researching it. And then once I did, the stuff that the internet gave me (laughs) was, (laughs) it was like beyond fiction. I mean, it was crazy the stuff that Colin Tennant did. So further Googling, speaking of Amazon, thank you, Amazon. I found, because Amazon also partners with very small bookstores across the globe, right? So on there, I found one copy of Colin Tennant. Look at this thing. Wow. Look at this cover. It's just- I love it. Everything about it. Oh though, my God. Like, Can you believe it? It's this... so dated. It's like- uh... Yes. How could this ever have been? No. So one copy of this through a book, a tiny bookseller in Somerset in the UK. And so I, it took like three weeks to get to me. I got it. I, you know, I went through and started reading it and Zibby just, I don't know if you, have you looked it up anything about this island or about- I have not. I mean, oh. I'd heard of Mystique, but I had not read anything about it. Just scandalous. I mean, just like things that, things that not just make my mama blush, they make me blush. And I'm like a modern person, you know, who is, has watched Fifty Shades of Grey. And, <laughs> and I mean, the things that he just so openly wrote about there and wrote them as facts. I think that was what was interesting to me is that it made me realize that history is written by the colonizer, by the authority, right? Mm-hmm. Whoever is an authority. And it is whatever they decide is what they want the world to remember about them and about what they've built or created. And so I actually think this is probably way more fiction than anything I wrote. I mean, it's just, some of it's just absolutely insane. I couldn't, I couldn't write some of the stuff or I did. I tried to write some of the scenes and my editor was like, not sure that's going to fly. You know, we can't like put that out there. So that is where a lot of the content and the scandal came from. And then I realized though, that again, this was coming through a male colonizing white person's perspective, all of this. And I just, to be honest, didn't believe him. I just didn't believe him. And so I thought, you know, this is my opportunity to write for as a Puerto Rican woman from the Caribbean, to write not just from a female perspective, but also to give the islanders a voice. And so that's one of the greatest joys I found in writing this book is where the minor care supposedly minor characters, the minority of this book, were so powerful. Uh, there's a character called Titus, who is basically the Colin's right-hand man and the overseer of all the business side and trying to help this crazy person um, navigate this island and keep everyone, staff, 
paid and working and and surviving. And I loved writing him and he's from the islands and he is educated and bright. And he was based on so many of my uncles, my t- tios and my grandfather and cousins in Puerto Rico who are bright, brilliant people, educated. And yet because of the color of their skin, they are often seen as maybe they aren't as educated as some of the other people on the island who are of the majority. So that was that was really fun. And then, of course, the mother-daughter stories. I love a good family saga. Like, that just, that speaks to my heart when I read them and I, I write about them. I love that interaction between family members. I'm fascinated by siblings, like birth order, don't even get me started. We could do me a whole podcast on birth. Order. I would be. I'm always. I'm always like, what number are you? You're yes. a first child, aren't you? Aren't you a second child? Yeah. Yeah. What are you? What are you? A first. Yeah. Sec- first. First. So am I. Yeah. Yep. Firstborn. I, I. I almost sort of guessed that about you. Yes. So I. I loved that insider insight that we all. That what's interesting is that we're also unique in our sibling dynamic, wherever you won't fall in that. But we all share like the exact same sort of like personality experiences. And and that's where as a collective reader nation, we can come together. And so I write a lot about siblings and about family dynamics and women relationships are really fascinating to me because they're so different from, I have two brothers. So I'm the eldest and then I have two brothers. I don't have any sisters. And I think that is absolutely part of why I write a lot about sisters because I live vicariously through my characters. And I'm also trying to like figure that dynamic out. My mother has is the youngest of three girls. And I grew up, I love, I'm very close with my teachers, my aunts. And I grew up being able to objectively sit in the room with my mom and my teachers and listen to them. And they would be fighting one minute and loving the next minute. And I always found that so interesting to be a little girl just sitting there listening to them because I didn't, it's different with my brothers. It's different with boys in general, you know? So I write a lot about about sisters and that was, that was certainly in this book in the mother-daughter dynamic. I am just rambling. You aren't even asking, getting to ask any questions. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. It's amazing. I hope I made it easy for you, not just... No, you made it great. It's perfect. It's totally perfect. I loved it. So when you were... Well, first of all, did you get to visit Mystique? Did you go? Oh, man. This is a fun one. So I planned... It took me a year to plan it, a trip to Mystique, because it's not so easy to get there. I didn't... Well, I knew it would be difficult. And I have gone to every location that I've ever written about in all my books. And that isn't like, well, I, I started to think, and I think that was where the writing muses, you know, taught me a lesson. I started to think that that was the trick that that I needed to do that, that that was essential. Otherwise, how would I do it? But I planned this trip to Mystique and you go, I would have to go from where I live to Miami, from Miami to St. Lucia. And that was on a like United, you know, United States flight. And then you get off in St. Lucia and you have to charter your own plane, private plane to St. Vincent. St. Vincent, you get off and you get on the ferry and then you take (laughs) the ferry. I mean, this is all, if you, if you're a normal person, you don't have a private plane that can take you straight to Mystique, which some people do. And and that that is probably the best way, right? To go. (laughs) But then I would have to get off in St. Vincent and take the ferry to Mystique. And then once you get to Mystique, you aren't allowed on unless you have a host. And that can be a hotel. So the Cotton House Hotel is there. The Firefly that I wrote about was there, but it's no longer. Through the pandemic, it didn't make it. But so I had done all that planning and booked a week at the Firefly, which is the setting in the book, too. And I was going to leave Zibby. Ready for this? The fun part. So fun. Life is so fun. I was going going to leave March 30th, 2020 was my ticket. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, I've been a couple of years. The the pain, the the ripping of my heart out 
it's healed back up again. But so I didn't get to go, obviously, because everything got locked down and I got vouchers back for the for the U.S., but everything else just sort of went into wherever everything went during the pandemic. And the people that at the Firefly at the time said, well, we'll give you a year to use it. <laughs> But of course, you we all know the year came and went and we still, everything was locked down. And then right after that, I saw that they had closed their hotel. It didn't make it and they moved everything over to another island. So, <laughs> and you know what? I'm okay with it though, because actually, Zibi, if I can be honest with you, and I haven't said this anywhere else, there was so much pressure then though, that you wrote a book about it. You ha- you paid all this money. Are you just going to lose all the money? You have to find a time and a way to go. You have to, you have to, it was very, uh, and I just felt like I've written the book. It's already getting published. <laughs> I have to go on book tour. I And write, and you know this, you're an author. Right after this, I'm going to start getting what I got right after Marilla, someone tapping. So what's next? Are you ready for next? And, uh, you know, that is, I, I didn't, to then plan a trip to Mystique, just because I have this, you know, this balance hanging over me. I just thought, you know what, if I, if I went, oh, and another, another person who actually gave me the best advice and sort of freed me from my guilt was George Saunders, who I mentioned because he is the great and almighty, right? So we all are just, and I was, when I found out that I wasn't going and I had to cancel everything, I was talking to him in an email and just whining, basically. And he wrote me back a very George Saunders loving but stern email. And he said, Sarah, you're a fiction writer. Just Google it. (laughs) And so I thought, you know what? If someone of his stature and, and respect is telling me, just Google what you need. I think I'm going to do that. So that worked out great. And I had background of the Caribbean being Puerto Rican. And to be honest, all that, that whole island area, the breezes coming off Puerto Rico, they're going right by Mystique. So I definitely used all of my sort of childhood background for that. But yeah, I didn't get to go. My first book, I haven't gotten to go, but I'm at peace with it now. Like, I feel like this is the way, and I think you understand, this is the way Sometimes a book will take the author on a journey mm-hmm. just as much as it is a journey for readers or or to write or whatever. But it took me on a journey and I realized that there is no pattern for how you should write anything. And there is no pattern to how a reader should read anything. And I think that's what I also learned through the pandemic is that don't put definitions or parameters on what you think the world should be like, because it's going to blow your mind. And that's bad. That's better. You know, it's better if you just go with the flow through the good and the bad, because it's going to be good and bad. And it's going to be real bad. Sometimes it's going to be real good sometimes. So I think we all learned that that lesson. I think that's in this book too. I rewrote it four times. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I rewrote it three times during the pandemic. But I had to, I think you get this. I had to because the world wasn't the same world that I wrote the first draft Mm -hmm. in. And I knew that if I put it out the way it was the first draft before the pandemic, it, it was sort of like a hollow bell. It was just sort of, it didn't have what was needed. And then I wrote it during the lockdown again. And that was just very dark. Let me tell you, that was a very tragic, dark, different book. And then I wrote it twice more afterwards when we were all just trying to figure it out. And again, it took me on a very different journey than any of my other books have ever, ever taken me. So, so I'm grateful. That's what I actually am grateful. Do I want to do it again? Kind of like the pandemic. Hell no, I don't, but I'm grateful. That's amazing. We're on to our last question, (laughs) which is, what advice would you have for aspiring authors? Wow. Well, I sort of just got up on a on a soapbox just a second ago about like you know, break open your own boxes and do your own thing. But I think another thing for for aspiring authors, I think you just have to um, 
two things. You have to be tenacious. You have to persevere. It is writing is not easy and it is not glamorous. It is heartbreaking and hard and days when you don't look, I have, I'll just show you, this is my robe. I have it on my lap. Like it's like this fuzzy, like I, there are days you don't get out of your robe and you feel like a monster and gross and you stink and you, you just have to be like, that's it. That's, that's the job. That's the actual writing job. And you have to love that part of it more than you like what I'm doing now, like talking and, and being out there and, and being a show person. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, really important is to love the actual work. And I think next I'm still learning. This is you have to enjoy your own journey. That, Mm -hmm. that qualifier there, your own journey, because you tend, we all tend to look, especially with Instagram and social media these days, even in, if you're not in the publishing realm, if you're just a normal person, we all tend to look at other people's feeds and their journey and say, look how great that looks. They aren't going through all the problems I have, or they're not, they're getting all these opportunities that I'm not getting. Why is that? What am, What can I do that's like them? And I suffer from that terribly, terribly. And I think I'm now coming to see that my own contentment and my own happiness resides in the smallness of being grateful for my journey and every day in that journey. And there is a beautiful piece in that, that I, I mean, I am just getting now in my forties that I definitely didn't have any time before. So those are my advice. Enjoy your journey. And while you're enjoying that journey though, just keep pushing away and working and doing your thing. Love it. Sarah, thank you. I've been so excited to talk to you. I just want you to know, I read The Baker's Daughter with a book group a long time ago when it came out and have like just adored it. And so it's just like very full circle-y for me to be here talking to you now So um, about Mystic Island. So anyway, congratulations on another successful book. I know it will continue to just keep taking off and taking off. And it was so nice to hear your story. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has really made my entire day, my month. I just... Oh, stop. <laughs> I, really have, I, I really have been wanting to meet you and this was wonderful so thank you for having me well i hope we meet in person soon that would be yes absolutely all right bye sarah have a great day you too (laughs) bye hi i'm zibby owens and you're listening to the award-winning podcast moms don't have time to read books if you like this podcast you will love my new anthology called moms don't have time to have kids Check it out and you'll hear from 49 authors about all sorts of things moms don't have time to do. All the authors have been on this podcast. Also, check out my TikTok, at with Zibby and Tracy, my other podcast, Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy. Check out Moms Don't Have Time to Write on Medium. And of course, my new publishing company called Zibby Books. And now back to our daily author interview site and a quick hello from some of my kids. Hi. Hi. Hello. Enjoy the show. Hello.